colleague and friend, Andy Kern, speak. Looking forward to hearing him and giving him a little grief. I'm working on my introduction next this afternoon a little bit, kind of getting ready for tomorrow. And uh, the Lord has a sense of humor, and that's thrown right out the door. <laughs> Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Since I'm skipping ahead, I'm pretty much going to rip through everybody's message that was prior to me today. And, but we're going to look at this passage of Scripture that's a very interesting passage of Scripture. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to read chapter 3 of Ephesians, verses 1 through 12. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the Gentiles, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace uh, of God, gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the least of all saints, all the saints. This grace was given that I, I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was from which from the beginning of all of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus or through Jesus Christ, to the intent, and this is my passage here, next couple of verses, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Very interesting passage. And it comes on the heels, excuse me while I get this wire going here, it comes on the heel of a passage where Paul is telling us and explaining to us the fact that he was given the mystery. The message of the church, the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace, a new revelation. And we come to this passage of scripture as he's explained uh, the verses from 8 on. To me, who am, the, who am less than the least of the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, uh, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. He's explaining the fact that that not only was he given the mystery, uh, this, new, this new creation, this new body, truth, but he's also telling us, and this is what Pastor Kirk will probably be talking about tonight, I'm sure, is that there is a commission to make all men see. Right. To, and, and the idea of making all men see is the idea of illumination. To show it, to explain it. And one of, the, one of the ways that I, I look at this passage of Scripture, and it, and it helps me put it in context, is, and Pastor Ware mentioned this earlier in the week, is simply this. It is what God is doing today. It's not what He's doing in the 40s, 30s. It's what He's doing today. Now, I understand the dispensation of grace was in the 30s and 40s. That's not what I'm getting at. I didn't lose my mind. But what would it be like if we went back and lived our lives today that way? We would be out of sync. We would be out of touch with what was happening today. And that's what happens when people open their, or their Bibles and they'll run through the Gospels or the Old Testament. And those are great books. They're inspired books. They're, they're part of the all scriptures given by inspiration of God. But until we understand what's given to us today, we can't understand how God wants us to live. And I want to say this because part of this whole message deals with when we look at the truth of the mystery. The truth of the mystery never is apart from the transformation Amen. given to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
You can't separate the truth of the mystery from transformation. And if you do that, you have an imbalanced Christian life. Amen. Now let's go to our passage that we have here, and I'm going to work my way through it. I have five points that we're going to look at. To the intent, the intention to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And he goes on, the last part of that verse, all things through Jesus, through Jesus Christ, to the intent, Paul's intention, God's intention through this new revelation that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Point number one, the church, the body of Christ is to understand the manifold wisdom of God. If we are supposed to teach it, we'll get to that, and reveal it and show it and demonstrate it and be an example to what Paul identifies as the principalities and powers, if that's what he's saying that we are to do as the church, the body of Christ, then it is implied that we should know what this is, right? God's eternal manifold wisdom. Well, the idea behind manifold wisdom is simply this. It's the idea of multifaceted. It's uh, complex, multicolored, if you will. In fact, in the Septuagint, the Greek term used for identifying Joseph's coat of many colors is the same word used here. It's, it's, it's multifaceted. It's complex. And, and those of us who have been believers for any period of time understands that when we look at our relationship with God and the things that God has, has done in our lives over the years, and we look back and we, we just scratch our head at how big our God is. And yet He still desires to use us. So this idea of the manifold, multifaceted uh, uh, wisdom of God. Well, what is wisdom? When I teach, I just finished teaching a class on the poetic books we went through Psalms and Proverbs and some of those uh, books. And we talked about Hebrew poetry and wisdom. A very simple definition that I like to give for the, for the term wisdom is this. Truth applied. It's not just knowing a lot. It's not just having a head, a head full of things. It's not the fact that we have a God that's omniscient. Although we praise God that we do have a God that is omniscient or all-knowing. But wisdom is bigger than that. Wisdom is not only knowing a lot, but wisdom is having the intelligence, to, the intelligence to apply it. Now, of course, the context here in the verse is talking about who? He's talking about God. And we understand that God is all wise. But what are we talking about when we talk about this manifold wisdom? I believe that it's referring to, and this is very broad, the context is dealing with the dispensation of grace, the mystery. But the, con the, the broad idea of the manifold wisdom of God involves this. God's ways, His character. It involves God's will. We find that through His Word. And it involves the works of God. It involves how He works in and through His church. And we find this idea here, he says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known or might be made known through the church, that Paul is telling us that we need to know what God is doing today. Paul is telling us that it is our responsibility. He says that you can't get around Ephesians 3.9. It says to make all men see. It says to make all men understand the idea of illuminating this idea of the dispensation of grace. How do we get this insight? How do we get this ability? Well, it comes from the illuminating and dwelling of the Holy Spirit. When a believer trusts Christ as his Savior, the Spirit of God, as we found out earlier this week, and we already knew, but the idea of Ephesians 1, the Spirit of God comes in and dwells us, Right? He indwells us. He, he, and then He begins to illuminate the Word of God to us as we study the Word of God. And what happens then? We begin to do what? Grow. 
Even though when we come to know Christ as our Savior, we have absolutely every last drop of the Spirit of God. There's no second blessing. You don't get it later. You don't go to a meeting where there's really powerful music and it ascends upon you and you've got it or descends upon you. You don't have it then. You have it all then when you trust Christ as your Savior. Amen. But you begin to grow. Even though you have it all then, you grow. Even though the Bible says we have the mind of Christ, we grow. I read a pamphlet one time recently that basically implied that because we have the mind of Christ, we don't need to pray anymore. And I, was, I shook my head in sadness. What kind of message is that saying? I don't need God because I live in the dispensation of grace. And when you find someone teaching or implying that, go the other way. Amen. Because if you read the Pauline epistles, he needed God. Every breath he took, he needed God. So we have this passage where he says, The manifold wisdom to make all men see is to be taught. But I want to do something here because I want to go back to this idea of a process of growing. Go back to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, and this is the, the prayers of the Apostle Paul. Now I know the person after me tomorrow is going to be talking about that. So I am going to tiptoe through the tulips around every part of the passage that he's going to deal with. Of course, Paul prayed a lot so we can get a picture here. Let's go to 17, 117. We know this is Paul's prayer. It's already been talked about. But I want you to notice what he's praying for. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what, is the, what, is, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, or to us who are believing. Present tense. According to the working of his mighty power. Now you'll notice in this verse that Paul is praying for the Ephesians to do what? Grow. Grow in their understanding, their knowledge, their wisdom. That leads to what? Remember I said this at the beginning of this message. That you cannot separate truth from transformation. Paul does not separate truth from transformation. They are connected. They are joined at the hip. And in this passage of Scripture, you see Paul telling them, the Ephesians, to grow in spiritual knowledge and understanding of God, the wisdom of God, their identity in Christ, the riches of His glory and His inheritance. Verse 19, though, goes on and says, and the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who are believing. It's not talking about the time you trusted Christ at Awana or CBC. He's talking about as we walk by faith. God works in and through us. See, this idea of this, this manifold wisdom of God was never meant to stay here. Amen. It's to be lived out every day, Amen. everywhere. Because when we talk to people, people don't know Christ, they don't know God, they're living in blindness, spiritual blindness. And God has chosen to use the body of Christ to bring the message of salvation what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace to people that live next door to you right. and to me. I don't know why he did it that way. I would have done it differently because I would have taken a shortcut. But I don't have the manifold. I'm not one who possesses the manifold wisdom of God to the extent he does. I just know what his word says and he wants me to live, to live his life through me. He wants to live his life through me. Well, let's go on to Colossians, please. Colossians 1.9. You'll see a pattern here. I also don't believe for a minute that when you go to Paul's prayers here that you're stuck in the spiritual world. Like some. 
I believe that they are definitely talking about spiritual position and about God's work and understanding. But you're not stuck there because Paul wants it and God wants it, more importantly, to come through our lives. As we just said, look what he says here. Verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we have heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Look at verse 10. That you may walk worthy. Now wait a second. There's something wrong. That's, that is a contradiction. Because don't we have all of Christ? Aren't we forgiven of, of all our sins? Paul must have been thinking of something else here. What is he talking about? He's talking about our daily lives. Right. He's talking about a transformation based on our understanding of who Christ is, our position in Christ, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in what? Every good work. Paul is praying for the growth of the Colossians. He's praying for the growth and the maturity of uh, the Ephesians. If you stay in the, in the book of Colossians, he, this bears out further. Now you're wondering, when are we going to get to the angels? Because he's running out of time. But if you go to verse 27 of this passage, and it says um, in, in chapter verse 27, you, you know the context, you know, you know the idea here of the mystery. Verse 26, this myth, the mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, but has now been revealed to, by, to His saints. <clears throat> to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In, it's Him we preach, warning, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Well, you know, the word perfect here is not sinless, but it gives us the idea of maturity. It gives us the idea of growth. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about growing. He's talking about that Paul, Paul says we preach who? Paul? No. We preach Christ. Paul preached Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Right. He never lost sight of who Christ was. He never elevated himself above Jesus Christ. In fact, I like to tell people, some people say, Paul, all you can go is the Pauline epistles. Paul, Paul, Paul. And I say, well, wait a second. You have to understand something. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended and he set Israel aside, he did not stop talking. Amen. He started talking through the Apostle Paul. So you have to understand, we have the words of Christ in the Pauline Revelation, but it's for a new dispensation. It's setting aside Israel and saying, now there's one new man in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he says, Him we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we present might present every man perfect or complete in Jesus Christ. So when we come back, let's go back to our text now. We have this idea that Paul is continuing. I believe he's praying. He's praying for the believers in Ephesus and Colossae. And he's, he's saying, he's, he's actually praying that they understand what? The manifold wisdom of God. So that through their lives, the angelic host will be able to see the glory of God. The church is to understand the manifold wisdom of God. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God, we're back in verse 10, might be made known by the church. The church is to understand it. Number two, the church, the body of Christ, is to be God's channel. And we find this in many different ways. We find this when Paul says here that we are to be a channel to principalities and powers. We also find it, and it's already been, been said here this week, when, when God says that we are, God through Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ, His representatives on this earth. 
the highest ranking official of another country in, uh, from a, a sending country is the, the ambassador. Um, we are called in, in, in 1 Corinthians 4.1, stewards of the mysteries of God. A steward has been given a responsibility. Paul tells us of a responsibility for every member of the body of Christ in, in Ephesians 3.9 to make all men see what is this fellowship of the mystery or the dispensation of the mystery. Paul tells us in Colossians, we just looked at, he said, Him we proclaim. So he's, he's telling here, us here that not only are we to understand this manifold wisdom, but we're also to be God's channel. We are God's channel to proclaim Jesus Christ. And then he gets to this interesting part, in this passage at least, to this idea of that the wisdom of God, look at the passage, might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. He is telling here us here that we are being watched. We are being watched. We are on display. Now, if we are on display to other people. When you name the name of Christ or someone finds out that you're a Christian in the workplace, what do they do? They watch. Why? Because they want to see if it's real. Because there's so much faith. They want to see if it's really real. But here, it's not other believers. He's talking about principalities and powers. And they're observing us. And it's really interesting because when you start looking at Paul in uh, uh, Pastor Sadler's uh, commentary, he makes the statement, uh, incidentally, uh, if you're looking for a very good treatment on angels... In this passage of Scripture, the Ephesians commentary is good. So there's my plug for you. It is very good, very balanced approach, and I really appreciate it. But you'll notice that Paul has, has been dropping hints from time to time throughout the Scriptures that we are being watched. Uh, if you want to run back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 4 9, we won't get into these a lot, but. This is not the only time Paul mentions this idea. 1 Corinthians 4 9. He says, For I think that God has displayed us as apostles last, as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. If you run back over, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 21. The apostle writes to Timothy, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing without partiality. So this idea that Paul is, is introducing here is not new. It's not the only time he says it. But he's telling us here to the intent that now, in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, you and me, who know Christ as Savior, given the truth of the mystery, are on display. Angelic hosts are observing us. What else do we know about the angelic hosts? And when I say that, that's what I'm, I'm referring to when I say principalities and powers. The angelic host, according to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16, if you would turn there, if you would, are created beings. They are not eternal without a beginning. They have a beginning in God. They are not omniscient. And we know that simply because of what he says to us as the body of Christ, to reveal God's manifold wisdom to them. They are not omniscient. Uh, Colossians 1.16 For in Him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invi invisible, uh, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And I wasn't going to make this point, but if you notice in that verse, it talks about principalities and powers, but it also talks about things that are, 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 are entities, things that are visible and Invisible. So there are things happening that we may not be able to see. 
The second, or the third aspect of this idea of angelic beings or hosts is that principalities and powers are used in a generic term, or a generic term, for a, a, a hierarchy of angelic beings. And that's about as far as I'm going to go on that. <laughs> However, the context will either tell you if he's talking about God's, God's angels, God's, God's uh, righteous angels, or demonic forces. And we have both, I think, I think, stated here. Most commentators in this passage say he's talking about both. I don't think so. I think he's talking about God's holy angels, the principalities and powers. Now, I believe the others see it, but I don't think he's dealing much with them. And I don't think they much care. Because if you look over to Ephesians 6, and you know this passage very well, verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. So who's he talking about there? He's talking about demonic forces. He's talking about the fact that every believer wrestles with demonic forces. Now what that looks like, I can tell you. He calls it in, in, in 1 Timothy, and I'm jumping ahead of myself, the doctrine of demons men were falling after. The teachings of demonic forces. I like what John MacArthur, I think it was him that said one time. He said, you know, uh, Satan is, uh, is rules the world. Uh, Ephesians points out this idea of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And, and all of that deals with the realm of Satan himself and the world system, the cosmos, the world order, uh, and, uh, and the flesh. And he says, the, the, to be honest with you, he, he's got the world and he's got the flesh the idea of, of physical manifestations really doesn't need to take place. He's, he's got everybody, he's got this, 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 this control over these things to where he's leading and directing people, intervening in their lives to do his will. Principalities and powers refer to either angelic hosts or demonic angels or demonic forces, specifically whichever context they fall. I believe that they are, and we're going back to this, the holy angels. We already saw in, in, in Ephesians 6, and I think we can agree on this, I hope we can, that he does say we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but, but with principalities and powers. So he is saying to us, is he not, in that passage, that demonic forces are at work. You have to, you cannot hide from that. You just can't. You can't, when you trust in Christ, I, I call it a, a boy in the bubble theology. I came to know Christ and there's nothing going on around me. It's, it's all there. And then I, I see things that just baffle me when I see godly men and women fall into hideous sin, lives blown apart, churches blown apart, and I think something's wrong with that theology because they need to read Paul. He, Satan is not sitting back just with his hands tied watching. He is at work and he desires to destroy you and me. You have a target on your back when you name the name of Christ. And he tells us that we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Paul also tells us that the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, not fleshly. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 6, you find out that it's truth it's righteousness, it's the gospel, it's salvation, it's the word of God. That's how you quench those flaming missiles of the evil one. You believe the word of God. You don't believe the lie. But don't for a minute believe that the lie won't be shot at you. And you know as well as I do because of your own experience and my own experience, and I can speak because I know human nature and I know myself that some, we've all believed a lie from time, from time to time, right? Uh-huh. We've believed the lie and we've seen it begin to destroy us 
maybe destroy our testimony, maybe hinder our relationship with our spouse, maybe make us at least back away from our relationship with Christ. He didn't move. Christ does not move, but we can. And then we're no good to anyone. We, we have to understand that Ephesians chapter 6 is real. Right. So let's go back. We're not, Ephesians chapter 6, unfortunately, is not my passage. Now I'm going to tell you exactly what these angelic hosts do. Get your pencil. They do exactly what God wants them to do. You can just write that down. Whatever He wants them to do, they do. I don't understand it. The idea of angelic, the idea of a ministering spirit or a, a messenger, angelos, messenger. I've always, I've always scratched my head. I even scratched my head in the Old Testament when they were much more prevalent. Uh, because I think, why God, why did you use them? Why did you just do it? But then again, that's just me. But they were still being used. And Paul tells us here that we are on display, that, that these, these angelic hosts are active to do whatever God wants them to do. But I want to say something here. Paul does mention angels and principalities and all that throughout his, 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 his epistles. <clears throat> but we can probably all agree that he doesn't talk a lot about it. I mean, he doesn't go into a, a theology of what an angel does, right? Not specifically. He gives us hints, no doubt. I think there's a reason for that. Why would I need to know? Am I going to be like the Apostle John and bow down to the angel? The angel says, whoa, 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 don't do that. Don't, don't bow down to me. And I think that's the tendency we would have. We would be wondering what they're doing. We'd be looking over, is my guardian angel there? I don't think you have one. Amen. But I still say this, I think they're at work. And I think they're doing whatever God wants them to do. And, and you know, and this, is this is an implied um, reason. But why are we to think that if the demonic forces are just at work running rampant, and I believe that they are, that we would see God's angelic hosts not. We just aren't told what they're doing. And I want to encourage you not to look for it. <laughs> don't. You don't need to. Let God deal with that. Because you know what? God wants our focus to be on Him. Amen. On Him completely. However He wants to carry out His work and His will is, 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 is His desire. And He wants us to be completely His. <clears throat> Paul says, I count all things lost for to understand, to know my Savior. Our revealing to them is, I believe because angelic hosts are not omniscient, not all-knowing, that from the beginning of this dispensation with Paul, they have been watching to see what God is doing. God did not call them together and say, I want to show you what I'm going to do. We find, look in Ephesians 3, you find several passages here where Paul gives us the idea that it's new. That in verse 3, Ephesians 3.3, 3, how that by revelation made known to me the mystery, as I wrote briefly. Um, uh, that's not it. Uh, verse 5, in other ages, was not made known. Verse 9, uh, from the beginning of the ages, has been hidden in God. Um, verse 11, we have, according to the eternal purpose, uh, He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is new. The dispensation of grace is new. And it was new to the angelic hosts. But I want to say something because I believe that just, be, just as we are on display to them, 
They are watching what God is doing work in and through us. You have to remember that they were around when Paul was saved. You have to remember that they were watching him preach. You, I believe they can read because it says in Ephesians he's writing to the angel of the church of. And I'm not trying to be, be funny at all because they're around and they, they're not stupid. They're not the slow angels. They're not, and, they're not, and they're not bound by denominations that I know of. They're not the bad, uh, the B angels, excuse me. I like that. The free will bees is what I really like. My dad was saved by a free will bee pastor. led the Lord by him. Uh, but there's not this, this denominational hierarchy of angels and they've got to get over the baptism thing or whatever it is in order to see the truth. They've seen the truth. They are seeing the truth. And I think they're still watching us. I don't think that's done. But I also think that they're watching the glory of Christ lived in and through the church. As we follow Christ, as we seek to serve Christ, our revealing to them, and that's the idea of making known, involves the truth and testimony of the mystery understood, taught, and lived to the angelic forces. The next thing we find in this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to move very quickly here, is that verse 12 tells us, uh, excuse me, verse 11, incidentally talks about heavenly places. And I, I, I'm gonna, I don't want to get bogged down into that, but Paul talks about being caught up into third heaven. And I, and I believe that he, when he talks about that, he's talking about being in the presence of God. And in, in Ephesians 1, I, I do want to mention this, Ephesians 1, I think it's 21, Paul talks about Christ being seated at the right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers. So there is a realm in the presence of God that he is, he is at least saying is a different place. And then he has this idea of heavenly places, and it's really the same word, but he's got this place where demonic forces and angelic forces are. And, and I, I honestly believe that it's simply unseen. We don't see it. I don't think it's layered like you have the atmosphere and then you got the angels. So when the space shuttle goes off and gets out the atmosphere, it's got to go through the demonic and angel part. I don't think it's layered. But when he talks about visible and invisible, I think he's talking about a realm of being. That's about all I've got to say about that because it's just such it's such an it's interesting, but it, we're not told at least I, that I know of um, that much about it. Maybe you, you know more. That's fine. But we have now verse eleven that tells us according. And Dick Ware mentioned this in his me message a couple of times. The idea here is that the truth of the church, given to the church, flows out of God's eternal purpose. In other words, verse 11 is the reason for verse 10. The word according, kata, means to flow, down, to flow from or come down from. And, and, and when he says according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, he's saying it was in that eternal purpose through Christ Jesus the Lord. Because of that, it came down. Because of that, if you go back, go back to chapter 1 and verse 7. These are verses that, that uh, Dick used. And you'll see this idea of, of flowing from or, or moving uh, down from. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. In other words, the riches of His grace, because of the riches of His grace, we have this forgiveness of sins. Um, verse 11, In Him uh, also we've obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of, of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. In other words, it was His will, and based on His will, He works all these things out from. You see a flowing out of. Um, I love it because you go into uh, uh, to, uh, Titus chapter 1, he, called, he says there's a truth that accords with godliness. 
In other words, there's that idea of truth and there's that idea of transformation and they, they, are, they flow out of the other. They're not separated. God, in fact, Paul tells us knowledge does what? Puffs up. And that's a tendency that, that man has. Even in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, doesn't he say, lest any man should boast? There's a tendency. I think God knew the nature of man. But whenever you see Paul praying, it was understanding spiritual wisdom and insight and identity. And it was what? Not to stay there, but to flow out of. And we have this passage back. Go back to our, our text here. We'll finish up. Uh, probably tomorrow. I have to ask Andy for some of his time. Um, but, but if you look at this, it says, according to the eternal purpose of God. When I read this, and this is very simplistic, and I'm just going to move on after this. But you know what? God wasn't caught off guard. When Israel rejected Him, their Savior, the Messiah, Christ, when He rejected, they rejected Him. Jesus, or the Lord, God, the Father, didn't call the angelic host into the situation and said, we've got to do something. What are they doing? In fact, I love the story of the resurrection because you see all of the disciples running around like little cockroaches. What's going on? They're you know, scared. And, and, and whenever you see the angelic beings, the angels talking to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't be afraid. It's all under control. And when we have this eternal purpose of God, we see that God is in control. Amen. And I, the first message on grace, I know you're in here. The fact that, and you mentioned this about people hurting. God knows. And His favor, His love, His compassion, did not blip once when you went through what you're going through or went through. Even if it was the most stupid decision you ever made, God's love and compassion and care for you did not move. The truth given to the church flows out of God's eternal purpose, brought about in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what was said. The sovereignty of God, the free will of man, those roads meet where? At the foot of the cross. From Genesis 1 to the end of the book, Revelation, you've got everything pointing to Jesus Christ, to the redemption of Jesus Christ. Different Gospels, different dispensations, one Savior, one Lord. The second last point here is Paul ends this, and, and I do believe that like most people when you look at this passage or this book, this letter, that it is divided in the sense of their foundational truth, foundational doctrines. And then the last part of the book is not practical application in a sense, and I don't like that. It's doctrine, but it's the function of doctrine. I heard a guy speak at BBI recently, and a good man, and he, was, he did a good job, but he made a statement talking about needing balance. And, and I've heard that before, you've heard that before, and I thought, okay, yeah, all right, but I didn't like it. And I started thinking about it. Whenever you say we need a balance between doctrine and practical, what you've done is you've said doc practical's here, doctrine's here, and they're opposed. That ain't Paul. Because when Paul talks, especially, in the, particularly in all of his epistles, pastoral epistles, he says preach doctrine. Teach doctrine. Don't run away from doctrine. The fact is, even though Paul starts to look at application in the book of Ephesians beyond, he talks about husbands and wives and unity and, and watching what you say. That's doctrine. Amen. That's Pauline truth. That's part of the mystery to the church, the body of Christ. It's just the function of doctrine. And he gives us the foundation of, of, doctrine, or of the doctrine earlier. But finally, verse 12. In whom, in Christ, we have boldness 
and access with confidence through faith in Him. The church, this is the last point, the church is the outworking of His fullness. Working in and through each member with the ultimate goal of bringing honor and glory to Himself. Amen. And He tells us here, and I call it a transition, whatever. He tells us here that now we have boldness. The idea to speak freely, to speak without fear of shame uh, or, or with confidence. We have access. We have access now um, to, the, to the throne of God. In fact, he invites us. He says in, in simple verses like pray without ceasing. In everything by prayer and supplication. Does those, do those verses tell us, teach us that God wants communion with his children? And then he says we can respond and act with confidence. Full assurance. Because Christ is in us and we are in Him. And I just want to close with one, two verses and we will be done. Two of my favorite verses that, all, that have also been talked about already and that's fine. It's a great. Philippians 2 verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Now, we would classify ourselves as in being in the absence, correct? Because He's not here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Develop it. Work it out. Not work for it. We know that. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Part of His good pleasure, according to Ephesians chapter 3, is that we might make known the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers according to His eternal purpose and live our lives with boldness, confidence, and live it by faith. Amen. So that in the end, he and He alone gets the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this opportunity. Lord, I pray for Andy, who is ill. I lift him up to You, Father. Um, I pray for his body. I pray that You would just uh, touch his, his, his illness, whatever it is. Uh, Father, I also pray that You would uh, strengthen him to be able to speak tomorrow. Um, Father, we just lift him up to You. We thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for the mystery of what You're doing today. We thank You, Father, that Your Spirit indwells us so that as we learn and as we study and as we grow, our lives might reflect You to this world. We thank You for the... I thank You for the, the schedule change. I didn't understand it, still don't. But Lord, You have had a hand in it today and we give You glory for that. We praise You for, um, again, for Your Word, Lord that goes forth from here. And Lord, after this conference is gone, the dust clears, we pray that we are living lights wherever You have us to uh, proclaim the mystery, to uh, live as You have us, would have us to live. And we give You glory in Christ's name.